Hi, it's Jen Taub. Welcome back to Booked Up, a podcast that features you, me, and our favorite authors. We release a new episode every Sunday morning. Believe it or not, for today's Booked Up Book Club, we are discussing the book, the man, the walking grievance machine, Tucker, yes, Tucker Carlson. I actually read Chad McMore's uh, very boring authorized biography of Tucker Carlson, and I have uh, joining me in the, the misery of that and discussing the book are two entertaining experts that they are Rick Wilson and Martin Pengley. Uh, and we're doing this uh, because we want to talk about some bigger issues about uh, the impact of Tucker Carlson and Fox News have had on our political space and because, you know, misery loves company. Rick Wilson is a longtime political strategist. He's an award-winning ad maker and political commentator. He also happens to be a fifth generation Florida man. In 2015, he emerged as one of the earliest and most vocal critics of Donald Trump and launched the Never Trump movement. His best-selling book, Everything Trump Touches Dies, also created a wonderful acronym, ETTD, used by millions on social media as a glib schadenfreude tinge response to each and every indictment or other misfortune that befalls those who have hitched their wagons to the Donald. Also with us today is Martin Pengley. He is the Washington-based breaking news correspondent for The Guardian US. Born in Leeds in England, Martin played rugby for Durham University, and the Rosslyn Park FC, and he worked at the Rugby News, The Guardian, and The Independent before he moved across the pond to America for love and for work. He has written articles about politics, books, and rugby in America. His work has appeared in Sports Illustrated and The New York Times. His first book, Brotherhood, When West Point Rugby Went to War, comes out. October 31st, and there's an introduction there by H.R. McMaster. Okay, let's dive in. So, hey guys, welcome to Booked Up. I am thrilled hey, that Jeff. you agreed to join me. And Happy I guess you here. you know each other, Rick and Martin. We do. We go way back uh, last few years, uh, known each other from 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 media world and, and I guess campaign world, you could say. Yeah, with a bit of book world thrown in. Book, bit of book world thrown in there. That's right. That's Speaking right. Speaking of which, congratulations on your forthcoming book, Martin. It sounds very Thank exciting. You. Yes, rugby is my thing that I drive the Guardian newsroom nuts with by talking about and covering, but um, it's led me to a book. So. Let me just say the name of the book, since <laughs> you're too shy to say it. It's called Brotherhood When West Point Rugby yeah. Went to War. Uh, when did yes. rest? It's when about the happen? Iraq War. That's what it comes down to. The shortest version of how the book happened uh -huh. is that I used to play seriously in London before I met my American wife and moved here. And I played against the class of 2002 when they came on tour. Um, they were the first class to graduate in wartime in 30 years since Vietnam. And I genuinely wondered what had happened to them in the years after. Then I moved here. I went to the Guardian desk. I had a very kind sports editor, uh, and so I went and found out. And the eight years later, since I wrote the first piece, it's it's now a full length book. So that's kind of in incredible. And you played, you played in prep school, or you played in rugby? I didn't in go to prep school. I'm a, I'm a state school boy. Um, I played I played club rugby oh, right. from when I was seven, um, and I because me and my two brothers are huge, so we just played. It's because it's a thing you do in England, same way as you play football here. Um, How tall are you, though? Because you don't look tall sitting in this little box. I'm actually standing there because I'm with my, my makeshift shelf desk. Um, I'm 6'5", I'm, I'm oh. just about. So I'm Good a, Lord. <laughs> so am I, actually. It's kind of shocking yeah, when people I'm an unwieldy me. individual, so I had a, I had a place in rugby. <laughs> oh, and so let's go back. So you went to public school, and I think I know, you told me you went to school yes, with I Liz Truss. I've made hay out of that in the past year. I went to a school in Leeds called Roundhay, so did she. Uh, when she was homing in on the Conservative leadership and being Prime Minister, she decided to attack 
or criticise Roundhay School for the education she got there, which was okay for her because she got to Oxford and ended up Prime Minister, so she did pretty well. So, I, <laughs> What was the defect in that? Too was it too woke too or woke. something? And she was or? talking about uh, 89 oh, really? to 92 or something. She was three years older than me. So there was no such thing as uh-huh. well. Um, most people rejected it. She also had a go at the area, said it was a red wall seat and le- left of uh, left of labor or something, which isn't true either. So I made some hay. Wasn't that the Thatcher era? It was the tail end of, uh, tail end of Thatcher, yeah, when she was there. And then started to come. So it was sort of the major yeah, the major first two era. Years of, of, of major. I, I come from a, I come oh, from a right. Guardian household there of total labor people. Um, so it's burned on my brain that that seat wasn't Labour until 1997, um, five years after she left, when she uh-huh. said it was some kind of woke hellscape. So, was... well, you've lasted longer than her, it sounds like, uh, in your dream career. But um, so, and uh, I, I want to talk about why we're, I guess, why we're here. That would that would make a little bit of sense. Okay, so I. I know that you know each other from way back, but I discovered Martin because he's like the only person on the planet besides me, um, and maybe you, Rick, who's actually read uh, the book, uh, the the hagiography about Tucker called Tucker. Um, oh, and kill me wow. now, but yes. I I just, I actually, even worse than reading it, I actually listened to it. And as bad as uh, Chadwick Moore's uh, can I just call it, you know, an extended fellatio session is um, as bad as it is to read. Can you imagine listening to it? That's a horror I don't wish to contemplate, honestly. I'll never get back those think- five hours. Although I did play at double speed, so it made it a little less painful. So that so, makes ma- it better, right? So, Martin, what are your, I mean, why don't you just tell us what your top level, like for the listeners who are not going to read it, what your top level impressions um, well, are? Well, for some pathetic one-upmanship, I've actually read it twice now because I reread it last night and this morning just to, to get myself back up to speed because I read it before it came out a month ago. Um, uh-huh. Impressions of it, it's hagiographical. It um, doesn't appear to have been edited very much. It's weirdly printed. Um, it. Oh, wait, weirdly printed. Printed. I didn't get the benefit of that. What do you well, mean? I feel in all, these, in all these criticisms, I should be careful because we all live in glass houses and I've got a book coming out, so God knows. But It's all right. <laughs> it's fine. You know what? As long as they, if they criticize you and they say the name of the book and spell your name right, That's it doesn't true. really matter. It is. It's this new conservative imprint called All Seasons Press, which I think their first major book was Mark Meadows, which was one of the ones I got my little hands on and wrote a story about. So I... What? Sorry, I Mark didn't hear Meadows, the name the of Chief's that one. Chief. Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, you had that um, one too. Oh, good. And it seems to, it doesn't feel like a, a sort of um, prestige product. <laughs> if you're holding it in the hand, it's, it's, it's got sort of strange kerning in places, strange printing. There's this weird. Yeah, no, I know kerning. Oh, weird. interesting. And what about the quality of the paper? Papers are, uh, paper, also. I've had poor, I've had poor in my hands. Um, it's got this thing where it has one of those um, photographable QR codes on the, at the end of almost every chapter. And I, uh, as a QR what? code on the end of every chapter, it takes you Excuse through, me. It takes you to, Why? The, to the book's website, which takes you to, to, to Tucker's Twitter show. Uh, or you can get, okay, you can get to the Twitter show. Okay, that is beyond tacky. It. And it's, it now looks about Okay, so, so what is, so other than it being poorly kerned, uh, mediocre paper, and just tacky uh, self promotion. It's hot content? garbage. Oh, hot garbage. Jen. It's Rick. hot garbage. Look, I, I, I am a very fast reader. I probably read three or four books a week. I'm, I'm an yep. absorbed guy. I tore through it, I guess, in a, probably about an hour and a half. Yeah, that's about right. Sweet Jesus. I mean, look, this is like Chat GPT wrote this, um, <laughs> and they didn't really bother to edit it much. And there's a reason why. It's one of those weird niche products. You know, yeah. you see the the reviews of it on Amazon or Barnes & Noble or wherever, and it's all five stars and this rate. And it's all the same crap from people who clearly haven't read the book. And they're all like, Tucker is a hero. He shows the libs. He he owns the libs. And, and it's just garbage. And there's a reason why it's basically flopped completely on, on Amazon on the Times bestseller list because it's just it's just junk. It's just crap. And, and look, if Tucker Carlson had been Mother Teresa and this guy wrote the same, 
you know, intensity, it would still be garbage. This is not a good right. writer. Yes. That's, that's one of the things just to realize here. Chadwick Moore is not a good writer. He is prolific, but he is not good. There is a difference between those two things. And He's also whew. a terrible reader of the book because it is the way he reads it, this sort of self-righteousness and the way he, he doesn't even punch the words. It's more like he's trying to imitate Tucker when he reads the book. But why do you think it's so, do you think, this is a real question, do you think it would have been possible to write a good biography of Tucker? And if so, how uh, would you do it? Because I suspect, yeah. well, one thing I wouldn't do is is write it in the style it's written in. There's a wonderful bit right at the very start where he's referring to uh, AOC, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, and he needs to say her name again. So going for elegant variation, he comes up with um, the doe-eyed authoritarian suburbanite. Yeah, I didn't know who he was talking <laughs> about when he as said a, that. As a like, newspaper desk editor, that's an example of um, what the Guardian newsroom calls POVs, popular orange vegetables named after someone trying to come up with another phrase for carrot. It's, um, <laughs> it's one of the most spectacular I've ever seen. I thought it was absolutely extraordinary. <laughs> I, I love that pop. expression. There's oh also my a Twitter gosh. account called Second Mentions. If you wanted to... Um, if you wanted to write a good biography of Ted Carlson, I think the main challenge might be that there isn't much there. He does have a fairly interesting right. origin story, and Chad Whitmore does his version of that. The Tucker's parents were very unusual. His upbringing is unusual by his dad, who was a media journalist. But they rush through that. That it's like rush through, like you're reading. This is like the Chat yeah. GPT stuff, right? That's 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 compl- there's no. It's like descriptive. You don't have any emotional. Okay. Yeah. There's, no vote, There's another stylistic thing that occurred to me, which is that he regularly says, he repeats through the book, that his, uh, Tucker's journalistic heroes are P.J. O'Rourke and Hunter S. Thompson. And yes. Tucker Carlson doesn't have, I would say, the depth, the talent, a fraction of it that they do. He, he, is, he is sort of similar in their images. He's, he's um, quick and, and can write, obviously write and talk fast. And he's got some, some profiles in the past, which I've, I've browsed, which are fairly good, but no, they're just not close to P.J. Raw level. And it's- I think that he, I think that's such a good point because I think that, I mean, I, P.J. Rourke was hysterical and I, you know, you could not get through anything he read, even if you didn't agree with him politically without admiring his wit. And I mean, I mean, Hunter S. Thompson, obviously was off the chain in so many ways in an original. And I think that what Tucker, mis- at least I get from this, that he thinks that just insulting people um, and, and saying that you have contempt for people who have contempt for you is entertaining writing. I, I just don't, I don't get it. Well, let, let me say this. I, I knew Tucker in the before times. We okay. were both on the Republican side of the fence um, because Tucker's not a conservative or a Republican. Tucker right. is a nihilist who loves Tucker Carlson. I think that. And he true. enjoys attention and the spotlight more than almost any person I've ever known who made the transition from being a, I use the term advisedly, working journalist to being a media personality. And and the reality is Tucker's really a product of the house that Roger Ailes and Rupert Murdoch built. He's a product that's a very successful product of, of be a smart guy who tells a lot of people who are not as smart as you that the elites hate them, that the right. smart people hate them, that the educated people hate them, that women hate them, that minorities hate them, that immigrants hate them, and give them permission to manifest all their own worst characteristics and emotions. And that's what Tucker is, and that's where he came from. That's the creature that, uh, it, you know, he got baked in the oven of, of Fox and it was the first time on television he'd truly been a success. He had his CNN bit and he had his MSN bit, but those things were not a moment where Tucker Carlson became a center of discussion in the conservative world or a center of discussion in, the, in American politics. And Fox gave him that, but it required that he enter the entertainment business of Fox, not an analysis or journalism. And it's all built around the, 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 the engine, the operating system that underpins Fox, which is this endless goddamn culture war screeching. Right. And, and that's where, that's where the, the, this book misses the boat. This isn't Tucker's character. This is the character Tucker plays. This is Tucker playing a character on TV that 
that has finally given him the attention he wants, the attention he deserves. I, I have a rule. If you meet me in person, you will not find a wide delta between who I am on social media and on television and who I really am. You know why? It's easier that way. You can live your life better right. that way. But exactly. Tucker, Tucker believes none of this crap. He's not anti-vax. He doesn't think the lizard people run the world. He doesn't like Alex Jones. He's doing this because the character he he was given and written for at Fox is the character that has made him the money he's made and gotten in the attention he's got. So it's so interesting, Rick, because I have heard that repeatedly from people in this business. And it's so distressing to me because this would have been a moment for him to come clean. He's been fired by sure. Fox. So that sure. is that is the biography that would be interesting because, you know, if you're in a movie, if it's fictional, uh, playing the villain is the best flipping role there is. I mean, you know, I don't, 100%. when I go watch Gone with the Wind, I, you know, Melanie, give me a flipping break. Like she's so detestable because we want to see, I think, played out at least in a fictional sense. It's sort of, we get out of, you know, all the bad side of our nature. If you can see it in a, in a, in a film, if you can see it in fiction, you kind of get to express it. And then you can go about your life being like a decent person, right? We all have, and, and I think it, it, it you know, I, I, I know that Fox News is, you know, at least most of it is this entertainment um, platform, as you've mentioned. But, you know, the idea that I, I, I just don't know why he won't come clean and how dangerous I just think things turned when when Trump was elected and he continued to do what he was doing. And then we see in these it, 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 this is the perfect example in this book. um, they try to defend him and claim that he really does love Trump and what he said in those texts wasn't true. And that's nonsense, right? He couldn't stand the guy. Why doesn't he just come? He could make, if he wanted to sell a book and if he wanted to he if, actually make money, uh, he would drop the persona and just say who he really is. And it's not entirely far from the character he played because some of that character he played was sort of irreverent. And like you're saying, he just likes being irreverent and sharing his opinions with this, the world. Don't you think his audience would still follow him to the end of the earth if he was truthful? Look, I think he would still have an audience. He would not have the Fox audience. There is a very um, well-honed, very, very um, deep bench of Fox PR and, and bookers and, folks that are constantly working the image of all their major players. Um, He doesn't have that anymore, but he still would have held a lot of the, the audience he had, particularly with younger men, because he does have a sort of demo. That's the same kind of weird attraction to younger lost boy type guys Uh as Joe Rogan and Alex Jones and a few of these other crazies. Um, But, but he would have held an audience in that same conservative space. He doesn't have it on Twitter, no matter how much Elon juices the numbers on, <laughs> on his show. Right. Uh, it's there. Look, it's there. It's not, but it's not like Fox. It's not like the, when you have the institution of Fox and News Corp lifting you and blowing hot yeah. air under the wings of your air, aircraft, you're going to rise. It's why the book mm-hmm. didn't sell. Listen. Oh, right. He had no to All these to idiots it. at Fox. Oh, right. Brian Kilmeade has written like 78 books. I doubt he's read 78 books, but, but he's written all these books. And they're only successful because they go on Fox, they flog the crap out of them. Bill O'Reilly made something like fifty oh million God. dollars in book sales over a decade. All before of his they killing books. Him. He made a yeah. killing on the killing yeah. books. Yeah. And I know the ghostwriter. He's a terrible writer. He's a <laughs> terrible. He's a fucking clown. Do they pay him though? Do they? Yeah, pay they the pay. Oh yeah, the guy ghostwriter got paid. Yeah. Okay. Good. But but all oh, of these Jesus. all the look they and they, they all go through Harper, which is integrated into the News Corp world, and it all works out in the end for them, right? But. Tucker doesn't have that anymore. And so now he's living in sort of a terra incognita that is not the same comfy, soft fe- feather pillow and and, and and soft mattress that he had at Fox. He's mm-hmm. got to eat, you know, sort of redefine what his audience is. And in a large way, it is the, it is the audience of Elon's fanboys who would pay eight bucks a month for Twitter. Right. That's interesting. Uh, do you, any yeah, thoughts, Martin? I've yeah, thought is of that your take? on similar lines. I, I think there's, it's a case of different ecosystems. I was going to make the point that he didn't get the not just the Fox flogging, but the right wing non profits buying up and giving out 
books as well. He didn't. Right. Uh, he missed oh, right. out on the chance once Tucker had been fired to have, what is it, a little dagger mark on the Beth New, New York Times bestseller? The dagger, yes. The oh, dagger. Right, the bulk orders. Bulk, bulk sales. Orders. Yeah. Bulk so, sales. Well, I think Donald Trump <laughs> Jr.'s first book was a famous case of that, oh, which gosh. turned me onto it, uh, understanding it. So he, he's lost that. Um, the flip side, although it's not as powerful as Rick says, is that there are different ecosystems and only in terms of the platform of finding and keeping a platform off outside the mainstream media, only in that sense, as I was slightly reminded reading this book of, of Russell Brand, who's just landed in oh, all right. that trouble for other mm. things. But he has this he has this place right. where he lives on YouTube, he lives to tell he lives on social media, he lives to tell people don't listen to the mainstream print mainstream media. And we, we had an interesting bit of analysis from our media desk in London this week about how much of that will, will not be affected by the allegations against him. So, sure. Right, but he had, he was renting, he didn't realize, he, I mean, I think part of now I see what this book is, is he's trying to say, which has been disproven by the sales, kind of like he made, as if he made Fox News, you know, that he was, he believes that, you know, he he doesn't get that he was a he wasn't a star without the star factory, right? He doesn't have their platform, right. and he didn't figure out how to have an independent platform like you're describing, mm -hmm. Russell Brandon. And I just this brings me to like the breaking news that we just had that um, Rupert Murdoch is stepping down, and now uh, he's letting his eldest son Lachlan take over. But is he the same flavor as his father, or is 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 this going to change? do you think? And would Tucker have a way back in with Lachlan? One, of the, um, each other? one of the books I've been speed reading over the past couple of days is the Michael Wolff Fox News book, which I speed mm -hmm. read two days ago. Um, there's a lot of con contradictory stuff in there about what Lachlan feels about Tucker. Some of it is Rupert being frustrated that he wouldn't rein him in. Some of it's the other way around. Lachlan's like, I mean, I'm not, I'm not a Fox watching expert, but I have read a bunch of books. I don't play one on TV, but I've read books done. Um, Lachlan Murdoch seems to be that's the sort of big question now is what does he do? No one's quite sure there, there's reporting, there was a book by uh, an Australian journalist Paddy Manning who sometimes contributes to us last year um, called The Successor and made to look like a poster for succession um, about Lachlan Murdoch and that, I came out of reading that one confused uh, either way, some some of Manning's reporting is saying, yeah, Lachlan believes this Tucker Carlson esque hard alt right stuff, and some of it was saying, no, he doesn't. He just sees profit there. The line that struck me, and I ended up writing a story about because it would was an, a Fox Insider said the quote was, uh, "The moment Rupert dies, Lachlan gets fired." As in, maybe that's just for intrigue, but as in, his position as successor is not necessarily secure. Obviously, Rupert is still around as uh, chairman emeritus now, but that's one of the things I was talking about in morning meeting this morning when the Guardian morning conference was brutally interrupted by Rupert Murdoch retiring. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's so funny. We think of it so much as a family business, but obviously the parent corporation is a publicly traded enterprise with a board of directors and who knows? I don't know where the where the money is actually, where the uh, share ownership is concentrated is it maybe it's just like succession with these trusts that are family trusts? And I, I think it's about 35% of it is in the hands of the Murdoch family that this is the single largest, 35 or 38%. I'm not an expert on that. Yeah. But, but I think to Martin's point, there will come a moment where, where in this big world that's hungry for media acquisitions, someone bigger than Fox says, we're buying this thing. Uh -huh. Or somebody in the private equity space says we're buying this thing or we're taking it private right or on the downside Elon Musk says I'm buying this thing and taking it oh, taking God. it private and then you'll have 8 hours of Tucker every day and it'll be like the North Korean TV channel with the lady in the <laughs> pink handbook screaming oh. all day long at uh, about the dear leader curing cancer and hitting 18 holes in one. You know? Oh my God, Rick, you know what I just realized? Mm. This is obviously Elon Musk's plan. That's why he called the the uh, Twitter X because with Fox News, he can just knock off the F and the O on the big sign. And he's ready. <laughs> right? You heard it, right? You heard it here right first. Right there, baby, right there. <laughs> Can't you see it? X News. I mean, that's he, what he's going to do. He could. But, uh, oh, but look, uh, and, and Elon is now in this circle of right wing um, tech bros, private equity bros, and media bros, of yeah. which Tucker is a part, um, who really 
I mean, as bad as Twitter has been for him as an experience, he loves having this much power over the national discourse. Uh I, I, I would, I would make an argument that I don't know what the Fox valuation on paper is today after Rupert's gone, but it is still a machine that, that runs, uh, it's still the largest cable network in the country by a lot of metrics. Um, they have amazing carriage coverage deals with, um, all the regional cable companies, so that the, it's worth something. And I think if he got a bug up his ass, he might do it. And, it, and then you would have a very different complexion to Fox and one that you would probably recognize only from your nightmares. Oh my God. I mean, they are, I just, I just, I'm, I'm just, I mean, I don't even, I'm almost speechless at this, this dystopia that we have now created. <laughs> I don't even. You're welcome. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, and I guess this gets us to, I, I just want to, before we talk about the dystopia, let's just talk about the, the hellscape that is this, this book. I mean, it's hard to even, I feel like I want to share some pieces of it besides being incredibly boring. Dramatic um, readings, if you will. <laughs> well, I have it though. I, I I don't have a physical copy. It's all in my, it's all right. in my, uh, on my phone on audible, but I did take, uh, oh, there he has the physical copy. I mean, everything from the cover photo to everything that comes out in this book, it's just his view of, um, masculinity and his view of narcissism. There's so much projection going on in this book, but I just, I just feel like any man who is secure in his masculinity, such as the two men I'm speaking with now, um, just wouldn't write the way he does or, or, or reveal, why would you allow some of the things that he has to say in this book to come out? I, I just find him to be, I mean, do you, for, as from a male perspective, do you find his, that his kind of I'm not a misogynist misogyny weird or his his sort of obviously mommy issues because his mother abandoned him not dealing with that it just it does it just is it is obvious from the male point of view that there's something kind of off with the way he thinks about himself as a me, man one of the first things that occurred to me reading back reading back through it today was the piece on the infamous Fox Nation streaming service with the testicle tanning in it that made yes. me immediately think the thing that jumped into my mind was the weird Ron DeSantis anti-Trump video. Um, that one with bodybuilders and X-Men and lightning bolts and yes. so on. I was put in the same, same mind space. And if, you, if you're talking about being a relatively ordinary bloke, um, I don't know how to deal with that mind space. I'm just like, what? <laughs> it's just so, it's odd. It's this weird place. And it's... Not that Tucker's necessarily in that place, but he's going to goes to it and shows it. Or is it what Rick said, which is he he knows that he wants that that's a market mm. to tap into. It's not it's not it's like incel adjacent, but not exactly right. It's a sort of um, guys maybe who can get women, but are I don't know just afraid of the way you know. I mean, women are gaining more power. And I, I just to be clear, I don't think all women are great. And I think women have all kinds of issues too. That's not my point, but there's something very weird. And I wonder if that's who he is or if that's the the, uh, the market that he's just trying I to think attract. It probably is the market he's trying to attract or the market that Tucker talks to. I think male resentment is a very powerful force at the moment. And I mean, I think, I'm, yeah. I think give him his dues, Chadwick Moore, Chadwick Moore says so. In a couple of passages. Um, True. Yeah. He, he, I, he kind of got that Tucker is not a, a rough hewn outdoorsman. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's also what's so interesting that what fits this, this, the, the story we're telling here is that it's very revealing that apparently Rachel Maddow, right, and Tucker remain friendly, or is that just because he got her into MSNBC? The way Chadwick mentions that she's never criticized him on air, is that true? No, no, no. Saying Do you know? I, mean, I don't know the answer to that. But but look, Tucker is an affable guy, okay? Because you he's, you've met him. You yeah, of friendly, course. Nice. I, okay. He's perfectly affable. I haven't talked to him for years, but 
but again, back in the before times, um, he was an iconoclastic guy. He wasn't. He wasn't a doctrinaire. Oh, wokeism is killing us. Oh, it's all the it's all the lesbian liberal Wiccans Immigrants. trying to destroy America. <laughs> right. Whatever it was. Um, but I, I do think that's that's one of the things about Tucker is he's puzzling around about masculinity. He's puzzling around about like like all these people that I'm trying to reach. Are they really the guys that go out and you know, as they say, take a shower at the end of the day rather than the beginning? Are these really the guys that go out and work with their hands? No. Most of the people that are following Tucker are are upper middle class white boy incels. And mm-hmm. and that is the demo that is the that again, those are the, like the Elon Musk fanboys that are out there. Oh, right. Those are the uh-huh. people that are following Joe Rogan obsessively. And and it's funny because, you know, I've had my scraps with Tucker in in public in the last couple of years. And it always he's always trying to posture like he's going to kick my ass somehow or that he's the tough guy. And and I laugh about it because I'm a genuine fifth generation Florida man. <laughs> I love that. My family's in <laughs> agriculture. I know how to drive a combine. Any 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 wheeled track, any wheeled or tracked vehicle you want to name, I can operate it. I literally, my hobby is on my property, chainsawing down major trees and brush cutting brush. I mean, these are the things like he's a soft-handed guy, as we like to say. Yeah. And it, and yep. I just I find him, I find that that weird contrast of obsessions about how delicate his masculinity is when a woman has a challenging either opinion or position or role. Um, I I find, I mean, look, I I was raised in the deep South. I I was raised to treat women with courtesy and, and, but that doesn't mean I can't judge somebody who's an asshole, male or female, but for him, Every every transaction in society between men and women is fraught with some sort of insult to Tucker's manhood. And it's just so – it's so small. It's so weak. Yeah, it reminds me. I think we exchanged a, um, um, maybe commentary on, on Twitter several years ago. I think it was Charlie – was it Charlie Kirk who – had gone to like a Home Depot or a Lowe's and came out with some like particle board. Oh, it was Ben Shapiro. It was oh. Ben Shapiro like, I have bought a piece of lumber. I'm right. like, lumber? It was like pine. Right. It was like a three foot piece of pine trim of some kind. I'm like, oh yes, Ben, tell me more. Right. I'm sure yeah. you're going to go out and, sh- and, and and sand that down and build something with it. Yes, of course you are. And I'm not trying to, you know, it's, to me, it's all about just be real about who you are and what you do. Sure. And I just, and I, you know, some guys can do that. Like my, my husband, Michael does, you know, planes wood and, you know, he's learned from a lot of his friends who are wood turners, but I'm not going to pretend that I know how to do anything. I was raised a certain way and I'm, you know, a little bit spoiled and, for me to try to pretend I'm like, you know, I don't know, whatever. I just think it's it's just very weird, the phoniness. Sorry, I, was saying, I have a theory about what kind of man Tucker is. And uh, I think it's, it's self-sabotaging. He's a journalist. Um, and in quite a understandable way to a British journalist who spent, in my case, 10, 15 years on Fleet Street before I came here. Tucker is, I think, the kind of guy who can give you a thousand words on anything very fast. And right. that's what I sometimes do. <laughs> I'm definitely guilty of that. Um, and you, if, you com- if you combine that with apparent amorality and willingness to go anywhere, you get this weird, to us, vision of, as Rick was saying, someone who's trying to hang around with the manly men and is sort of writing a thousand words about the manly men very quickly, but there's actually not much there. Was it, it's, it's to reach for another British comparison. Um, someone or a fair few people said, one of the worst things about making Boris Johnson prime minister was you shouldn't make a journalist or a columnist like him in charge of anything except producing a thousand words very fast in an entertaining mm-hmm. way. I mean, like I said, I don't think um, Tucker Carlson is close to his, his heroes, P.J. Rourke or Hans Fred Thompson, in, in style or, or humor, but he's, he's got a cert, obviously a certain pretty good facility and it therefore goes sideways into TV. But but it's like the guy, I know he's sober now, so I don't necessarily need to make this comparison, but it's like the guy sitting at the bar who can bullshit on any topic. It's like, I, at the point of this book, when he's opining about 
the perfect kind of trees and the way, you know, the, you know, philosophies of life, just, you know, and then, and then you find out that, his, you know, apparently his wife doesn't watch any television and does is completely isolated from the world. And you're thinking like, well, it strikes me that this guy, you know, he admits that he got like D's in, in high school, was a terrible student, but yet somehow, you know, is an expert on what's wrong with the educational system, knows all, you know, has the, the, the import, you know, has decided what, you know, life is about for everybody, um, other, you know, including himself and that he, I, I just, I, he just strikes me as it, you know, he calls people incurious, but he just strikes me as a complete egomaniac. And oh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt sorry, you. Sorry, that's, the, that's the columnist mindset. No, go ahead. To me, the all oh, having it a, a thousand my, words on any topic. It sounds like you know, not knowing anything about it. about it. I mean, you can, you know, certainly in Sweet Street Papers and American too. Imagine you, you can get asked for a thousand word column quickly, please. I did a few years ago. It got some pretty grisly results, so gave up because it's like if I don't. Can I back you up and ask you, when you say Fleet Street, that's a metonymy I mean, That's for, for the street in London that goes from uh, the Strand down to the, to the bed of the River Fleet, which is in Farringdon Street, where I used to work. Fleet Street used to be. Which was once called the Fleet Ditch and was so filled. Yeah, with dead dogs and garbage. Oh, my them. goodness. And, and what is it? Met, and, but when you say that you worked on Fleet Street, is that where, which kind of newspapers are Well, it used to be pretty there? much all of them. Uh, and now, uh, or for, for quite some time, it's been none of them. But they, they, some of the buildings are still there. The pubs and the wine bars are still there. It's known known colloquially as well as the street of shame, because you should be shame you should be ashamed to work there. But it's that journalistic. Oh, that's you know, I, I will I will say I know enough to talk about this for, for some time, and you don't. And he loves having, you know, a million people. I mean, there, you know, as much as he talks about how dangerous it is to uh, be an egotist and that, you know, this idea of the narcissistic injury and that how he makes sure that he's not falling into, you know, believing his own hype is by what, like walking around one of his expensive places he lives yeah. in Florida or Maine or what have you. Uh, you know, it's... it. What bothers me the most in this book, is th this is a book that he read before it got published. And the in this book, he somehow, um, he somehow manages to come across as really racist and sadistic. And I'm thinking, I don't know if you noticed this part when you were rereading it, but when he had his first uh, journalistic job at this place called the Policy Review, um, he was going through what they ca he called the the nut mail. Like that's how he describes people who write letters that are they're a little bit off, you know, off the, the you know their rocker to to some degree. And he said that baiting crazies is a mean thing to do, but I couldn't help myself. And he would tell these some folks that were writing to the newspaper from prison that he was working on their case, yeah. and he actually. Ed admitted this. I mean, it's it's in it's uh, yeah. That's it's that's insane. the sort of the merciless, cruel side, um, which also comes out in, in the in the book. The sections about um, his life as a frat brother, um, living on a porch, but uh, uh, you know, living on a porch in a house full of dudes at college, but also reading, you know, making his own shells for his books when he's in there. He's got that sort of mm -hmm. slightly more literate side. To that, to that persona, I think. But the, you know, mm -hmm. the cruelty. What was that? Um, Adam Serwer said it. In the, the, oh, the, the cruelty, cruelty is the point. Is the point. That, that becomes right thing. And in, in, in the case of like uh, PJ O'Rourke, the cruelty is there, but it's not the point. It's part of the humour. And in the case of Tucker Carlson, it's just cruelty. It, yeah. But why would he? You know, why would you have that included in the book? Why would you include the fact that you knew it was cruel at the time, but it was entertaining and not reflective at all? I mean, if you're saying it's the Adam Sewer thing, like the cruelty is the point that you think the readers of this. I mean, his readers who are who the few people who do read this are going to be adherents, and they're going to see that, and it's going to make them, you know, inhuman. I, I just think I would have taken that out of the book if it were me. Um, it, plus, it sounded yeah, again. It sounded familiar from newsrooms. There's a certain sick sense of humour in newsrooms that echoed quite strongly there. Um, and you'd normally self-censor oh, it, as you're saying, for the actual page. You wouldn't print it. Um, 
Look, all of us have dark humor and we can all say things that are funny in the moment, but you don't, why would you, why would you print that though? And similarly throughout this book, he's trying to, you know, he keeps saying, I'm not a racist. And my, you know, the whole replacement theory is really, you know, about votes that you know, with Democrats are trying to bring in immigrants who I absolutely have nothing, you know, he doesn't, he claims he doesn't care, you know, that he's not racist. It's not about the race of these immigrants. It's just that, that, that he thinks the Democrats are just trying to, you you know, trying to harvest voters from abroad. And yet at the same time, I'm not even going to repeat what he said, uh, that he that he also let remain in the book about uh, people in Vietnam. He described Asian people in extremely racist ways, and it's right in the book. So how, what do you make of, make of the fact that he allowed that to stay in? I think, you know, it's Tucker, isn't it? That, that line on Vietnam, Vietnamese people is from an old New York Observer piece. Um, and the book doesn't have any notes or footnotes, which that was one of the reasons I... It doesn't have footnotes, it doesn't have um, sources at the back. A lot of it is from clippings, and that was what... It's not presented as that Tucker isn't saying it directly to his brother, but he said it uh, in 2000 when he got stuck in Hanoi. Um, it's, just, it's a casual, heedless cruelty, I think. There's just, there isn't a filter to that. So I have two different theories of the case. I have the one theory, which, you know, Rick is saying, or three theories. Rick is sort of saying, this is just a character he played on Fox News. And I have Martin saying, well, it's kind of the way people are, this kind of person who comes out of the media or the, uh, you know, journalism word to write a thousand words on anything. And then I have the third part, which is, no, he's really, really cruel, sadistic and racist, though, because... There, you don't think any of that's true? Because the way he's he comes across attacking the ADL and kind of trying to flip uh, the criticism that people have had about the stuff that he peddles, he tries to justify it. It, it seems like there's a lot of racism and xenophobia and anti-Semitism that he really believes. Am I missing that? Or again, is it just a lure for followers? I mean, Rick, you worked in this work. I mean, you were actually good at this. At this, uh, it, this, this is he, look. This is a guy who, again, I truly believe Tucker is a nihilist and an egomaniac <laughs> for for whom the appeal of playing this character. Once in a while, you end up playing a character so long, oh. you become that character. Uh, the method acting takes over. And, and I think that's sort of where Tucker is. The method acting took over. There's a degree of, of an affirmative feedback loop he gets from people who love that kind of stuff, like that, that encourages him to do more of it. And look, he's been, aside from being fired from Fox, where he, I, I'm going to argue he's landed on his feet because he hasn't lost his money right. on it. Um, and he's still a lot of the national dialogue, not as much as he was. The guy's never really had a whole bunch of consequences in his life at any point. He's never really had a moment where he got legitimately canceled for something he's done that's cruel or stupid or racist or sexist or whatever. Um, and and so the more they get away with it, the more they get away with it, the more they do. But Trump does what he does because he got away with it for generation, for decades. Um, and so Tucker gets away with it, makes money off of it. And believe me, he loves money. He is very much, he's very much a young capitalist. So that's great. That's fine. Whatever. But he, he, there's, there's never been a downside for him being a dick. But why is he, is this, it, to me as someone who, I mean, I, although I grew up in the Midwest, you know, upper middle class white kid, um, you know, I, I have I'm a liberal. I mean, now an East Coast latte, you know, pumpkin latte, you know, chugging liberal or what have you. Uh, you know, this idea that we all just sit around all all day hating him. I don't even really usually think about Tucker. And so what is this thing? That's an artifact, though. That's an artifact, though, from the machine at Fox News where Roger Ailes, whatever you think about him, was a genius sure. of television who was driven by the most enormous uh, – chip on his shoulder of any human being I've ever met in my life, except Ron DeSantis. 
that chip on his shoulder led to that model that's been very popular, especially with lower educational attainment voters and viewers, of saying elites right. hate you, they have contempt for you, they want to destroy your church, your lifestyle, your family, your beliefs, they are coming for you. And that ideal, uh, that ideal of Tucker as the tribune of the working man is total garbage. It's bullshit from start to finish. But it is the thing he learned at the first place he was a real success. And that's what he's that's why that stream continues, I think, in Tucker's communication. And there's a grain of I mean, you know, there is there is grievance that is in this country legit. The question is, how do you, if you're someone who has power and a platform, how do you help empower people so they actually can have, you know, a better life than they have? If all you do is have them glued to the television and ask them to buy bad pillows and whatever products you're peddling, you're not really right. helping them figure out how to organize or how to get sober or how to run for office or how to, you know, get into therapy, or how to make the federal government more focused on maybe the needs of people in their region of the country. There's a lot you could be doing. I guess that just doesn't, what, that doesn't, no. people don't want to I mean, watch that's, that? The, that's the line uh, in the Michael Wolf book. That is it, that, that's, believe me, that, that's Oprah. Yeah. That's not Tucker. And, and oh, you there's a, a demo for Oprah. There's a, right. you know. No, yeah, there's a line in the Wolf book also, that the Daily Beast reported. Uh, where Rupert Murdoch says he calls, um, you know, with apologies to language, he he call he says Sean Hannity is is quotes retarded, and says something on the lines of you know like most Americans, and that's the contempt there for the you know for the rooms, for the viewers. Yeah, it, it. Yeah, I mean, if you want to really talk about contempt. The people Tucker claims he is the tribune of are people he would never let on his compound right. in Massachusetts or let in the front door of his multi-million dollar home in South Florida. These are the people that Tucker's security detail will stop before Chadwick they can come within Moore, 50 feet of Chadwick him. Moore in the book more than once describes retainers uh, of Tucker Carlson in Florida and in Maine, including his cook at one, at one of the Yep. I love how you use the word retainer. In American speak, that means... It's so medieval. It's like help. Right. We would call that help or staff. Retainers what my, my, my preteen girls were. Retainers. Um, exactly. Surfs, I think, is the... Oh, my God. My favorite part of this was when it was like, oh, God, he had this job, and he was only making whatever it was at that time, you know, $40,000 a year. And here he had to put he had to put four kids through private school. And I'm like, are you kidding me? I mean, like, like as I, there's, there's all this, there's nothing wrong with private school. I went to one, I couldn't afford to send my kids and I'm sending them to public schools, whatever. But there's this, this whole sort of like, everything is this big piece of entitlement throughout this book. But I, I'm just so sick of Tucker that I want to spend our last minutes together talking about anything else. Cause I think I just, <laughs> and so <laughs> I want to just pivot to like, how, how in the world are we living in this timeline where the former president and lead candidate for office is, what is it, four indictments and like two major civil trials. And how are you, how are you going to yeah. spend your time? Which one are you going to focus on or all of the above? Rick, I'll ask you first. Can I, can I be really honest about it? You don't it? care. I'm not paying much attention to any of them. Oh, what are you doing then? I think, I think, look, Trump's not going to be in jail in November of 2024. Where is he going to be? Is he going to win? He's going to be he's going to be the Republican nominee for president, and we're going to be locked in the most brutal political battle in the history of this country. I agree. Um, he's not going to be in jail, and all the people who magically think, uh, you know, oh my, they're following breathlessly every twist and turn in these cases. Right? Doesn't matter. I know he will be the nominee in the Republican Party, and and look, no matter and this, if you want to talk about a strange world we live yeah. in. He has a very good chance of being elected president if we don't do everything right on the pro-democracy side, because this is a country with an electoral college system. We're narrowly divided, and, and he has a lot of advantages in this race, one of which is an army of Tuckers. And, and so I, I'm, not, I'm not obsessing about the comings and goings of each, each trial. Um, and, and look, I don't want people who are anti-Trump to watch these trials and think, that they're slam dunks. 
Let me tell you something. The Jack Smith documents case, that courtroom is in Fort Pierce, Florida. 62.54% of the people in Fort Pierce voted for, in, in, the, in, the, in that county, Martin County, voted for Donald Trump. There's a lot of chances where these cases go off the rails, where something goes wrong. Yeah, I mean, here, you know, having, and you know this, the judge is everything. She can set that tone. You know, it's, I, you know, I was, I, I sat through the uh, several days of the E. Jean Carroll trial with Judge Lewis Kaplan. Right. He said, I love that judge. He's a, ve- you know, judges are very active in their courtroom with how they run things and it can make all the difference yep. in the world. So I don't see that case uh, having a lot of promise, but she may just drag it out anyhow. Um, and obviously. Yeah, look, there, there, there's just, the, the thing about it is if Trump is, a free man and pulling oxygen into his lungs, he's not going to be in jail. Uh, there, the, the appeal process takes years, and, and I don't think the election, at the end of the day, um, there's an argument that my pollsters and our, and our research is that he's gotten stronger because of it, not just with Republicans. It's because he's back in the spotlight again. He's back in the middle of the dialogue again, and and. Again, we've got to do everything right to beat him. That's what well, I'm thinking hey, about. I, and, How do you do everything and right? And Martin, I'm going to hand the mic to you in a second, but I want to say this, so that I that even if Trump loses in 2024, he's going to run again in 2028. <laughs> he's going to run again every time he wants to win back the White House. He's going to run when he's dead <laughs> and uploaded to the cloud. <laughs> Martin, what are your thoughts? Uh, I know as as a Brit here in America watching what the heck is going on uh, with Trump, what do you, what do you think we're going to um, well, I, I, I have a sort of hybrid view now because I'm, I'm a Brit in America. I'm still a Brit. I'm not an American yet, but I have been here 11 years um, working on politics the whole time. Um, and my kids are American and my wife's American. Um, I, <laughs> well, my first thought is, oh God, I'm going to have to staff those trials, which means I will be in front of a computer in some <laughs> form with a team of people trying to work out how on earth to cover it. I don't think uh, he's going to prison. I agree with Rick. I think he's going to be the nominee. I think it's not even remotely counted out that he could win. I have had a couple of interesting conversations with people in uh, the, quotes, transit, uh, transit, well, sort of um, presidential transition space, places like that, but people who know a lot about politics, people who know a lot about conventions, actually. Um, and one interesting conversation was uh-huh. about whether there might be a convention fight on the Republican side. Now, Rick will know a lot more than that about that than me. But it was an interesting prospect, the idea there might actually be m- more than Ted Cruz briefly tried to do in 2016 but never went anywhere, whether you could see a proper old convention Barney to try and take the nomination away from him. Rick will probably say no. But I thought it was a very, very interesting idea. We, we had a brief window to do that in 2016. It fell apart quickly. Trump controls every aspect of the Republican National Com- Committee. The, all, every, almost every person that, that would get a vote in a process like that is controlled by Trump. I, I think it's – look, a lot of reporters out in the world, a lot of rep- Republican activists out in the world still believe there could be some sort of externality like that. And I just – I can tell you I'm, I, I've been to uh, like six or seven Republican conventions, including a couple as a kid. You know, it, it's not going to work. The floor fight, the floor fight stuff, the rules fights, it's just not going to work. Um, and and like I said, there was a brief window in 16 and all the people that were super brave behind closed doors, when it came time for them to go on the floor and cast the actual vote, they said, oh, God, Trump's people will murder us. And we can't do it. They literally said we're going to get murdered if we do this. You know, the lack of courage. You know, this is the other thing. Men and women in the Republican Party, other than a few like Liz Cheney and uh, and others, uh, Adam Kinzinger and such, what what cowards? I don't. I, I guess I don't have to. I'm speaking to the choir here, but I would stand up to Democrats. I don't understand why they're why they're not going to get murdered. They just won't have as much not power. Fun. I mean, not I, brought up rugby you know, players. Speaking of rugby, I just want to say, Martin, I and I hope that you don't consider this objectifying. But when I was in. Um, College, all the hottest guys played rugby. And I, I, I'm looking at you, George Marshman, in case you listen to this show. Um, <laughs> he was just a, some a of the teams friend. I was in, and I was a forward. That's not true. That's not true? Okay. Well, they were the, the you know, there was also women's rugby, and those women were yeah. pretty tough. This is rugby is like a, a fall down in the mud, 
kind of break your break your nose and teeth and still go out it for is. a beer uh, kind of current sport, right? Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo played at Radcliffe. Um, so, oh, incredible. Uh, H.R. McMaster, former Trump advisor, has been nice enough to write my introduction for my book. And when he found out that out, there was a moment of wonderful uh, bipartisan unity on, on my social media. Yeah. On the because rugby? <laughs> I mean, and this is what I think. I think the way we should just tie this all together is I think you should, you should, uh, you know, in the sort of Mark Zuckerberg, Elon Musk way, why don't you reach out to Tucker and make peace with him about your, your review of his book and, and offer, you know, offer him to play, play a rugby match with him. I'm sure well, he would Given the state of me, that might go horribly wrong for me, never mind him. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a while, I guess. So, okay, how do, how do, uh, what didn't I ask you guys today about either Fox News uh, life in Florida or life in D.C. Um, or yes. is that where you I'm are, in Martin, in D.C.? Yeah, life in D.C., life in Florida, or uh, where we can find you. Uh, Martin, uh, what do you um, have to say You can find me uh, on the Guardian website writing a silly number of stories every day. You can find me on Twitter, at Martin Pengeli. Uh, Facebook, various. Um, I've got a public, public book on Facebook for the group Brotherhood. When West Point Rugby went to war, that's always good to follow and I'll be popping up on a lot of syndicated radio, I think, in the fall, going on and on and on about rugby, but at least that will put me in a silo. So. Well, I hope you go on Morning Joe. They should have, do you have, do you have, a, do you know I the don't. I'm there? hoping my the small publisher's PR guy does. I also, also relative to, relevant to what we've been saying, I, I kind of want to get on the Fox and, Fox and Friends sofa. I've got a, I, I've got a naive idea <laughs> that rugby is something that Republicans and Dems can and do play together it's true to a degree it's also not true to another degree but and we can and the nice thing about rugby is no one gets an argument of whether it's called soccer or football it's just rugby whichever side if you're very lucky one day i'll take you out for a beer and introduce you to rugby league which is different and why a certain section of british and australian society gets very cross if you just say rugby but that's a whole other (laughs) oh there you go see it's controversial we don't know that in america and rick how about you where do we find you what didn't i ask you and what is what is some some hopeful thing you can leave us with today okay your question about florida is the the answer of florida is everything's trying to kill you all the time <laughs> whether it's animals weather drivers or other floridians um i am at the rick wilson on the twitter machine still uh, I am the Rick Wilson on Threads, which is where I've spent a lot more time lately because it's just nicer. <laughs> same on Insta, same on Substack. Um, uh, and, uh, and to give you something optimistic, um, eventually all chaos eats itself. And you're seeing that happening right now with Kevin McCarthy and the Republican Party. And the only teacher in politics is pain. They're inflicting it on themselves. And I have a, I have a, a strong sense that we are... We are going to end up with a Republican minority in the House, and it will cause a corrective switch in some of the viability of some of the crazies that are elected uh, in the Republican side. So I like that, that eventually all chaos eats itself. My only concern is you say corrective, but why don't you think it's just going to be only the people left in the Republican Party are increasingly more fringe? Why wouldn't that be the result? Well, because the country is largely center right uh-huh. in non-coastal areas, and you will eventually end up with with even the harder seats getting big, getting losses tagged into them. You'll end up with redistricting and with with a realignment that works a little better. It's a longer topic than we have time for sure. now, um, and there's a lot of math underneath it that um, that smarter people than me have have come up with. But look, there's hope out there in the future. But it, it's going to require a sort of cataclysmic failure of the Republican Party before it really takes hold. Well, I mean, I would pay tickets to see that. <laughs> <laughs> well, great being with you. Thanks so much for having me. Thank Thanks, guys. So, you know, I I'm kind of have mixed views about where we landed about both the Tucker Carlson biography and who he is as a person, and maybe it doesn't really matter. I mean, I, I, I hear what uh, both, Rick, both Rick and Martin were saying, and I'm thinking that maybe the closest truth is that, yeah, he was playing a role and he just couldn't separate himself from that role. But 
I'm not sure that um, that 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 and I don't think Rick is trying to justify his behavior, but to the extent that you start to believe in the character you're playing, I think it stops being a character. And for those who maybe think that Tucker doesn't believe the things he says, I think that if you continue to uh, spout uh, the, the kind of hateful ideology and whip up people's grievances for your entertainment, then you really believe in nothing. And I think that's really where Rick had started, that he's kind of a self-aggrandizing, uh, fame-loving nihilist. And that is a big problem. One thing we didn't get into about the book is that it seems like he sort of is considering, but then not considering a run for president. That might be something he might want to do. And it's like this kind of trial balloon where he's, he, you know, sort of says he wouldn't necessarily be interested in that, but I'm sure that's something he would love. I, um, I think he's probably, I would, Others would agree more charismatic than someone like Ted Cruz or Ron DeSantis or any of the other uh, Trump replacement wannabes. But fortunately, at this point, I don't think there is anyone who would, um, you know, would work toward getting him elected. But it does concern me because there still is this appeal that I think people sometimes would rather whoever these audiences are, um, look to hating other people around them, look to a kind of self-defensive, everybody's against me in this world, why don't we attack them? This kind of whipping up of hate instead of the recognition that life is much more nuanced. All of us have been through things personally because of our own lives and personal experiences, also things because of our own class or race or gender backgrounds, that different things have happened to us that have shaped the way we behave in the world and how we perceive things to be fair or not fair. And to spend your time and to, even when you have plenty of money, to spend your time trying to just whip up grievance and make people feel more uncomfortable it, just because you know that makes them watch you when I believe, and I know that Rick said that's Oprah's audience, not his audience, but I believe someone like him, if they had chosen to, if they wanted to, could have pivoted from these kinds of messages of grievance and hate and still kept their audience um, engaged um, if they wanted to. He could have had interesting guests who tapped into the things that disturb people and try to move people into a place uh, where we would be more unified as a country and work toward solving some of the problems that we care about and share. And, um, you know, I will never get back those five hours or less since I watched, listened to it on, you know, double time of my life. Um, but it did give me, I'm, I'm grateful that I listened to it because it did give me some insight into just how boring, self-centered, and dangerous people like this are because all they care about is themselves making their next buck and not the rest of us. And, um, you know, I'm glad he's not on air anymore, um, but there are plenty more uh, people like this guy. And uh, again, um, you know, thank you for being here. Um, I think that I, I've had enough of... Um, of these hate reads. Uh, I don't even hate, I wouldn't even say that I, I hate Tucker, but I hated reading this book. Um, and I, you know, I, I genuinely, um, genuinely look forward, uh, to reading a book, um, that I enjoy, uh, a lot more than this one. And that brings me to, uh, the end of the show. I promise you another great episode next week, um, with, I promise, a book that we will all enjoy and an author uh, that will knock your socks off, someone that you can admire whose work is um, work and their character is something that we can all strive to emulate. And so thank you for spending this time with us on Booked Up. I look forward to seeing you next week where we look into the writing habits, the lives, and the work of some of our favorite nonfiction authors. 
Please let us know what you think of the show. You can write to us at bookedup at politicon.com. Or if you prefer snail mail to email, you can write to me at bookedup, P.O. Box 147, Northampton, Massachusetts, 01061. Please follow us on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. And when you're there, please remember to give us a five-star review. It really will help other people find the show.